Welcome to the last talk of the day in Islander FG. You are about to see and listen to moving from hacking IoT gadgets to breaking into one of Europe's highest hotel suites with Ray and Michael Hubler. If you have questions afterwards, they do have some time for some Q&A. There are three microphones throughout the room, so we are recording this. Please step up to the microphone so that everyone can hear your question and it can be recorded. Thank you very much. Hi. Okay, so welcome to the ending of this conference. I hope you enjoyed Black Hat so far as much as we did and you're ready for the grand finale, our presentation about hacking IoT gadgets up to hotel suites. So who are we? I'm Ray, an active member of the German hacker association Chaos Computer Club. For like 20 years or so, I've been researching, lock picking, I'm a technology enthusiast, and by work I happen to sleep a lot in hotels, so that's what brought me into researching this topic. And I'm Michael, <clears throat> hello everyone. Uh, I basically have been playing with locks all my years, uh, all my life. Um, about um, 40 years ago, they were mechanicals, of course, and I got into lock picking and competitive lock picking in lock sports. Uh, but then electronic lock started. I became an electronic engineer. I continued to do that. A few years ago, Bluetooth Low Energy came into all the locks, and that we looked into these, and that's what led to this presentation. Okay, so what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about smart devices. These are devices using Bluetooth low energy connected usually to a smartphone. And of course, you will learn how to analyze and probably hack those systems, or if you're on the other side of this <laughs> business, how to improve these or build better ones. And of course, we show how we applied those methods to uh, various products and the vulnerabilities we found in that from cheap padlocks to hotel door systems. Out of curiosity, a raise of hands. Who of you has used the mobile key system offered here in the Mandalay Bay Hotel? Yeah, okay, so I see you wanted to see first this presentation, which is very good, but to make it clear, the Mandalay is not the hotel we successfully attacked. So you might well <laughs> have a good way using it. So the agenda today is Bluetooth LE ecosystem, so what's in such a system involved. We give a short introduction to BLE itself and how to analyze such BLE systems. Then, as said, tell you the vulnerabilities we found in our prior work and then what we recently researched in BLE hotel keys and the one system that we broke. And also talk a little about the responsible disclosure process we had with the vendor and the challenges involved with such a disclosure in a real life systems that has real impact in the real world. So the BE ecosystem. What you usually have, our examples are mostly locks, so we have a smart lock, or so-called smart lock, connecting using BLE to a smartphone app, which is connecting over the internet to a backend API service. So if you have such an ecosystem, there's a lot of attack vectors. One on the side of the electronic lock you can read out probably firmware or other secrets from the chip. You have side channel attacks like power attacks to get out keys. You can insert wires into the device and get to debug ports, power a motor, activate it some way in a way that wasn't intended. And also there's mechanical attacks like vibration or hammering to it or magnets who manipulate the inner actors to defeat the lock in a mechanical way. On the smartphone, of course, there's things like malware stealing secrets. So probably don't use a mobile phone uh, key if you have malware on your phone. And there's also possibilities to relay, which is called distance fraud. So you're not at your device, but somebody relays the data and still uses your phone to open your device. Then there's the internet. And as we all know, there's back-end web services. They have vulnerabilities. So this is not the main focus on our talk but they have been multiple found in this field also where systems had flaws in the back end. What we'll be looking at first is the connections involved. So between the lock and the smartphone and between the smartphone and the internet, 
there are connections where you can sniff the data, you can man in the middle, and you can impersonate one of the two sides if there's no verification. So altogether, there's quite a lot of attack vectors you will learn about today. But to understand that first, an introduction to BLE, so that's a link between the lock and the smartphone app. So BLE is Bluetooth Low Energy. It was designed as a cheap, low power alternative to classical Bluetooth, so that things that run on a battery can use it for a longer time. It is part of the BT 4.0 specification, so it has been out for quite a while already. And it's quite different from classical Bluetooth, so if you know that, some things may be different. It's mainly used for the so-called IoT devices. Those are usually not in themselves on the internet, but using BLE connect to something that is online. So it's communication between the device and your smartphone, and there's lots of things like locks, what we talk about, but also light bulbs, even sex toys, heart rate sensors, all of these things connecting using BLE to a smartphone. So what's the security of Bluetooth Low Energy? There has been a very good presentation already in 2013 on the Wood Conference, with low energy comes low security. And what they basically showed is that it's very easy to listen to BLE connections, and we somehow have sometimes the impression not everybody implementing this stuff is aware of that. There are secure options to make secure BLE communications, like out-of-band key pairing, where you have to provide a key on both devices in another manner, or 4.2 elliptic curve cryptography, but those are very uncommonly used in those devices for various reasons. So what you'll usually find is an unencrypted link layer, and the application layer has to make sure to provide the security. And if that doesn't work, you find the things that we are going to talk about. So how actually to analyze this BLE layer? If you want to analyze an app, you're doing it usually on your own device. So there you have control over the data going in and out. So the easiest way is on an Android phone to enable the debug mode and activate the so-called HCI snoop lock. That makes your phone record all the data coming in and out on BLE, so you can later analyze it. The same is possible on iOS. So you install the Apple Bluetooth debug certificate. You can download it from Apple, and for a few days, you have uh, like a debug functionality giving you the ability to dump the data your phone communicated over BLE. It's a little more complicated way, so we would recommend if you have an Android phone, you can use, for, try this first. So if you have done that, just use the app as normal. Um, what we have found out is useful is to make timestamps. So note down, at this point in time, I opened the log. At this point of time, that and that happened. So later, if you analyze your data, you know what, what, what was which action. Then download the log from the phone, and you can analyze it with a very common analyze tool, like, for example, Wireshark. It's a PCAP file. So I'm not sure if everybody here knows Wireshark, which is a network analysis tool, and it gives you ways to look into such a dump. So you see here, it's a search communication with a destination. In this way, localhost always is your phone, and the other thing is here, in this case, a Texas Instruments device, so an IoT device using a TI chip. It also will decode the Bluetooth protocol information for you. So Wireshark is aware of BLE and knows which kind of packets there are and will show you what kind of packet you're looking at. You usually will add a filter to find the packets you want to look at. Mostly it's writing or reading from so-called handles, and at the bottom of here you see the value. That is actually the data written and mostly the things you're looking for. So you're trying to look into the data. So this is if you want to analyze a protocol. For attacking a real system, you have to sniff the BLE from the air. So there's basically three channels a device advertises on, and you have to listen to the right one to catch a connection. But there's cheap sniffers who can do that, who listen to just a channel and get your connection. The classical tools for that are the Adafruit Bluefruit LE sniffer or the Ubertooth one. There's lots of presentations about these. They can easily bought like on every online shop you'll <coughs> find in this field and they support live feed into Wireshark. So like you have Wireshark running on Ethernet, you then have Wireshark running on a BLE link. The disadvantage of those devices is they sniff only one channel at a time. So if your device hops in a sequence you don't know, it works approximately a third of the time, so it's okay for proof of concept, but it's not reliable for a real life attack. So our favorite tool is called Beetlejack by Damien Cockrell. It has been released at Black Hat, I think. And it supports a firmware for cheap devices you can buy, like the BBC Microbit DevBoard, 
you can buy for $15 from Fry's or whatever, BLE 400, the other fruit sniffer, so you flash firmware, or actually the tool will flash the firmware for you, and then you can use three devices at a time and uh, watch them in parallel, and it's much more than some sniffing. The options are man in the middle and lots more. So if you build such a setup, I did it by putting together a few creative components, some duct tape, so that was my first working sniffing setup. Michael then made a little nicer setup with a Raspberry Pi. So that's a compact setup running on a battery pack, sniffing BLE on all three channels. You would probably even be able to fit it to a smoke detector or deposit it somewhere hidden to record data. So that's how to get the data from the link between the device and the phone. Now we also have to look at the link between the phone and the back end. And this is usually HTTP or HTTPS. Only very few apps today use HTTP. We actually encountered one, so it still happens today, but usually it's HTTPS. So if you want to man the middle of that, you have to install a fake root CA to intercept the traffic. But that's possible. There's tools doing that basically automatically for you. They create that fake CA, and this is something not to break TLS for other people, but to analyze your own traffic. So it's not an attack on TLS, it's something everybody knows you can do. So you analyze again the traffic of your device. So on iOS it's easy. The middle, middle tool creates a certificate CA for you, and you just declare that it's trusted. <coughs> that was also possible in Android up to version 6.x, the 6.x. In newer Android versions, you need a rooted device because you have to hard code it, change the built-in certificate store, otherwise it won't accept your certificates. If you can't use a rooted device, there is an option to modify a specific app you want to analyze by changing the manifest in the APK. There are stocks on that online, which we have linked in the slides. There are lots of links in our slides, so be sure to download them after the conference and check out the links that will give you lots of information about the topics we're covering here in a very short time. But this way you can change the manifest and change the network security config so it trusts also the user store. So even on a non-rooted device, if you modify the app, which is not a very complicated thing to do, uh, you can uh, get the uh, CA to trust and to man the middle your data. The only thing is there are some apps who have countermeasures and Michael will tell a little about what you can do then. Yeah, <clears throat> um, sometimes the application itself wants uh, to protect the user as well from a rogue CA, which is a good thing. Um, so in this case, sometimes the apps even tell you what they're doing. Uh, sometimes they just um, stop working. Um, but um, what can you do then? Um, there's a few basic uh, ideas. The first one is rather trivial, but uh, helps quite a lot uh, of, did help often. Um, usually there's more than one app. There's an older version, potentially for Android, or there's an iOS version. Um, <clears throat> basically, sometimes only one of the app does, does, does this. Um, slightly more involved would be the second option. You can modify uh, the application. Um, that's, of course, you have to find out uh, how to modify and so on. There are some tutorials on the internet for that. Uh, the third one is uh, a very powerful tool. Um, would be called, <coughs> the tool is called Frida, and there's a framework called Objection. This is extremely powerful. You can do a lot of things uh, with that. You can modify all the calls within the app. Um, it's beyond the scope of this 50-minute presentation to uh, go through all of that, so we just flip quickly through this. You would run, in, for example, in the case of a rooted Android device, uh, you would run a server there. Um, if you get lucky, you can then just run this objection framework, and um, there's predefined commands like this Android SSL pinning disable. This will try to disable some known SSL pinning frameworks, and uh, again, if you're lucky, then uh, the app will work afterwards. If that doesn't work, it's a little bit more complicated, but again, you'll find good tutorials. You would have to write uh, a JavaScript file for Frida um, that can basically change all, um, a lot of um, things within the app, and in this case, it would just return um, the certificate is good. You run this, and then at the bottom, you see a screenshot this time of another um, tool, um, uh, and this, um, shows that, uh, in this case, TSL pinning, TLS pinning is then uh, <coughs> disabled. 
So our advice for vendors is yes, TLS certificate pinning is a measure to protect your users from rogue CAs, but it doesn't protect your traffic from analysis by hackers. Uh, so do not rely on that. Um, okay, uh, the tools that you then can use to analyze the traffic. Um, on Unix command line, we use Mitten proxy. Um, if you want to have a nice user interface, you can use other tools like the Charles proxy. Uh, there's also the Burp suit or Fiddler available. It would look like this on the command line. You get a log of all the transactions. You can zoom into one of them. And uh, in this example, then you get um, already one of the keys we wanted to extract from the traffic. Um, a nicely printed out JSON um, file. Right. So our advice to use this would be um, do it right from the start because um, sometimes you get a system that updates itself um, immediately and you would obviously miss this and it would be difficult to get back to the old stage. Um, yeah, and it is very useful to have a dedicated rooted device like an old Android device that's not too expensive um, to do this. Okay. Then, <clears throat> now that we talked about how to collect the data on these two interfaces, let's have a look into a real-world example how to analyze this data. Um, this is an um, easy example. It's like a nice puzzle you can do like uh, on an evening or weekend. It's a small BLE padlock, one of the <clears throat> really cheap ones. Uh, we should note this is research from last year. Meanwhile, uh, the manufacturer has improved um, the system. But in 2018, it was like this. Um, the first one is we wanted to analyze the backend connection. Turns out we don't need any uh, rogue CA for this um, because it just used HTTP traffic. You can see the password right there. Uh, you can also see a 16 bytes um, array called lock key. So that was, uh, in this case, you. Well, maybe you could assume it's AS128. And basically, when we decrypted the Bluetooth traffic, that's the link between uh, the app and the lock again, um, it was random, looked really random. Um, so we just took a chance and decrypted it using AS128, and it doesn't look random anymore. As you can see, there's a lot of um, zeros. Um, and obviously, this is uh, properly decrypted. Uh, the next thing you would do is you look for patterns, compare several sessions, you'll see things that are um, the same in this traffic, and um, from a few sessions then you can deduce the protocol. You see there is like session IDs and things like that. Apparently there is a replay protection implemented uh, by a session ID. What you then can do, what we actually did is verify this, look for weaknesses. So. Um, one of the approaches we do in this case is we write a script using LuPy, also this other food library, um, and mimic the application, and then talk to the lock and explore the protocol, use fuzzing techniques. Yeah. So that's the usual <coughs> approach how to, to look at this. Um, this, was, this protocol was not so difficult, as I said, a nice puzzle for an evening, something like that. Um, what if it's not that easy to understand? You just get encrypted traffic, it's all random, you don't understand what, it, <clears throat> what it's doing there. Um, then it makes sense to look at the thing in the middle, um, the smartphone application. Yeah? That's <clears throat> obviously um, something that holds all the information how um, the system works. Um, we just wanted to note that um, some legislations um, prohibit decompiling applications except for specific reasons, so please check um, local leg legislation before you do that. Um, okay, there is two systems in use today, Android and iOS. For Android, it's not that difficult to obtain readable source code because um, the applications are typically written in Java and that's compiled to bytecode. You can decompile it back to Java using tools that are available online as well. Um, sometimes you get compiled C++ code. You need different tools for that, like, um, for example, NSA EDA, what we heard about today, or, of course, EDA. For iOS, it's typically a little bit more difficult, but also possible. You have to get the decrypted uh, application file first. Um, these days, you would need the jailbroken device for that. 
Uh, but then you get ARM binaries, and there's also tools to decompile this, like again, DDA or Hopper, and so on. Once you did that, um, it's typically a good idea to look for what does the application with Bluetooth, like you know, search for a term like Android or Bluetooth, um, or AES or crypt. And the first example, um, you see that it's, yeah, you find the, the place where it's actually talking to the lock. The second one is an example where we found a key in an application and uh, yeah, the key was one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven, eight, and so on. So um, basically, if you see something like this, you think, ah, okay, maybe let's look at this a little bit more. Um, there could be other vulnerabilities in there. Uh, uh, one more point regarding um, looking at applications, specifically also Android um, code. It's really nice that you can decompile it to Java, but um, often it's uh, obfuscated. Yeah, that means there, the symbols are readable, but you don't, can't make any sense of it. It's really hard to read. So um, there's, for example, um, yeah, it's called BR something, byte array four. Uh, then again, if you see like uh, a string that's not obfuscated, that says key data is null, then uh, yeah, just replace it using refactoring tools like Android Studio, and um, you get there. We have a very strong opinion on obfuscation. Um, we, we say obfuscation makes analysis harder, but it's not impossible. So it slows down us. We cannot help you as a vendor then. It does not stop criminals. They will still attack you and your customers, so um, don't do it. Instead, design your protocols in a way which is secure even when they are known, right? Well, yeah. So now <clears throat> let's look at a few things that we found this using these methods. Yeah, as promised, we'll show you a few examples of vulnerabilities that you actually can find in IoT devices using the methods we just have shown you and you hopefully will apply in your research in the future. So first, what we look at is a typical cheap padlock, which are around on Alibaba or various sites. Blue, BLE padlock, Bluetooth padlock, if you look for those, those might show up. So they have a shim-proof mechanic, so they are better than most of the cheap locks you get at Home Depot or something. But it transmits the passcode in clear text over the air. And for this lock, to our knowledge, disclaimer, we haven't bought it last week or something, this is still unfixed, so we consider it an uh, O-day, but on the other hand, the vendor for sure knows he didn't put any encryption in there. So that's nothing like we could disclose to him, he already knows, he just didn't care, obviously. But it's cheap. But so if you have such a lock, you look at the traffic, we find this one right request, it's basically the one we showed you earlier, and if you look in that, we find an, a 32-bit, 16-bit uh, hex string here, which we convert to decimal, and it turned out that's exactly the key we set in the app on the lock. So 01, 02, 03 was the key I set on the lock. So when I sniff it on the air when someone uses this lock, I can just use this key, enter it to my app, and without any hacker tools, open his lock using the code I sniffed on the air. So this is really just a pwned system by design. So it's not the only lock that way. Already two years ago at DEF CON, there was a nice presentation by Rose and Ramsey. They tested a broad range of Bluetooth locks for these simple vulnerabilities. So 12 of 16 locks, imagine that, they tested, had simple vulnerabilities like replay, like getting the key, like fuzzing them and getting them open and stuff like that. Two of the padlocks they tested remained unbroken, and they said, oh, they might be a little better. So accidentally or independently from those locks, at one of these locks, the master lock, uh, Bluetooth padlock, it's like a 60 to $80 lock, we figured you could attack mechanically. So this lock now locks. You basically, it's locked. And instead of using the app, we now use a high-tech hacker tool called a magnet. And we attach it from the back, and by this movement, from moving it over the side and turning the polarity from time to time, we actually turn the motor inside the lock. So what usually would have been activated by the electronics, now is done by the magnet, and the lock opens. <laughs> so actually, we disclosed that to master lock right on DEF CON, because in the Q&A I mentioned it, and someone approached me, hey, I'm with master lock, and showed it to him basically on the conference. 
So they hopefully did something about it, but we never had contact, so I'm not sure if they, if they changed it or not. They have a bigger lock where it's not that easy, but probably they did something, I don't know. So the other lock that remained unbroken by the Rose and Ramsey research was the no-key padlock. And that's actually one of the first BLE padlocks ever created. It was a Kickstarter campaign in 2014, which raised much more money than they expected, so a typical thing going through the roof. So they had quite some money to, to develop. And a note here, the research I'm now uh, showing you is for the original firmware, which was in place 2015 to 2017, and our responsible disclosure process in 2016, after quite a while, I must say, led to a firmware update in 2017, fixing this to a new protocol which we haven't looked deeper into. But the no security wasn't as bad as the lock we showed before it. Must be a reason that Rose and Ramsey didn't find it. It uses actual AES 128-bit encryption using the reference implementation, so that's something would say, okay. It also uses different secrets for the owner of the lock and friends you share the lock to, so it's not like your friends could use their key to change your lock or something. What we find out very early by analyzing the backend traffic is the time restrictions were enforced in the app, which of course is not the best thing to do. You could just manipulate the backend traffic and circumvent the time restrictions, basically if you shared this lock, you could open it any time. But the main vulnerability, so that's the real thing we had to disclose, was the secret uh, transmission of the, of the code to the lock. It was transmitted using individual AES session keys. For, for each session, a new key was generated, so that's also good. But the session key generation was done in a secret handshake, so something like, oh, nobody knows how we do it, so it's secure, using the hard-coded AES key that we saw before, one, two, three, four, five, six. But that's not the problem. Every hard-coded key would be as bad as that is. So it basically was security by obscurity. As long as you didn't know the protocol, how they exchange a session key, it's okay. But if some evil hacker comes and uses a disassembler, he can find this part of code which actually does the calculation of the session key. So we looked a little bit into it. Uh, funnily, this was actually in a binary SO file, so we really had to disassemble. We couldn't use the Java decompile shown earlier. But once you understand it, you saw it's a very simple principle. The app sends a nonce, so a number used once, of 32 bits to the lock. The lock sends a second number back to the app. So now both parties know bo both numbers. They XOR these numbers together, so they get this first value here in the red corner. It's a 30 bit two value, which is added to the pre shared key. So we change 32-bit in a 128-bit key. I'm not sure what that's supposed to do in security. And then we get a new key by adding it up to the center of it. And this new session key, which you could derive from traffic you just sniffed, was used for all further communication. So they thought about cryptography but did it wrong. So we disclosed this like the end of uh, 2000, or in the beginning 2016. At the end, we did the full disclosure and in 2017, they finally fixed it. But so this shows also something important. Even if a vendor claims to use AES, that doesn't mean it's secure. It's probably better than doing home build protocols, but still look for vulnerabilities, look for key exchanges, there might be things like that. So that's the previous things. What we're all going, <laughs> wanting to hear is BLE hotel keys. So what we're looking here at is the BLE layer and the back end. So, but let's first ask, why BLE for hotels? So is this really a clever idea to have a wireless hotel key? The main purpose, of course, is self-check-in. You don't need a key card anymore. Your mobile phone is the key. For the hotels, it means they can probably reduce staff or use the staff at more valuable locations. And everybody of you who stood in line at the Mandalay at a high traffic volume will appreciate the ability to check in yourself with your phone and skip that line, right? So it could, looks kind of attractive. But the challenges such a system poses is that secure pairing, unlike in a device you own where you could like pair from a QR code you get in the package or something, is hard to do here. You walk to the door and you want to communicate. Pairing, no. Then they have usually deployed the hardware in the hotels for quite a while. So they have a retrofit, probably old hardware with new modules and not have the most recent cryptographic chips in there. And then it's a complex ecosystem of a hotel chain somebody building their app, somebody building their lock, probably a third party integrating the SDK from the lock vendor to the hotel app. So it's many people who have to work together. But if it all works, how does it work out? I have a booking somewhere, and I have the app and an account in the app, and somehow I have to get the booking into that app. 
That actually might be the first weak spot here, because in the system we had a look at, uh, you could add the booking by things like your booking number, your beginning, end, and stay, and your name. So that's not something everybody knows. But this is data somebody could get by social engineering. And if he manages to do that, he can get your key on his app. So that's the first point where there might be a weakness that you could think about. But things like this are found lots of in hotel systems. If you have good social engineering skills, you probably get into your hotel room anyway. Then you do an hotel uh, online check-in in your app, and the mobile key is transferred to your app. So what you do now is, here we're showing an example. Actually, if you're wondering why we're in the Black Hat Hotel, this was man in the middle replaced by our proxy. We thought it's funny to replace the company logo by man in the middle replacement. And then you can use the, the app to approach the lock, say unlock, you see it's communicating now, the lock is blinking yellow-green, and your hotel door is open. So that's a normal use case. So this is how something like that would work. We looked at two different systems. The first one we're looking at is not the one we broke. We call it the Hotel H, so because we don't have to name here hotels we didn't break. And it worked after figuring out in that way. The back end to the app sends a key, so this is a bit, a bit complicated here, a key K, as well as an encrypted version of this key, which we call K star. Only, and, and K star is encrypted version of K by the key KS. Only the back end, which is under control of the vendor, and the lock, which is under control of the vendor, know this key KS, so your app doesn't know it. The app sends now the encrypted key to the lock. So the lock, knowing the key KS, can derive the unencrypted key K, and now the lock and your app can communicate using K, but you, haven't, you as a user don't have to know KS. So now the BLE traffic is encrypted with an AES key that a passive eavesdropper doesn't know. So that's actually a good, a good thing. So we didn't find an obvious attack vector on that, except if you manage to obtain KS. So you could probably do it by taking apart the lock and finding a vulnerability in the chip used there, but that's a path we don't got into because we don't take apart other people's locks for research, uh, at least if, not, if we're not allowed to do so. We do it, of course, with locks we own, but in this case, we didn't research this further. And also, we, when we tried to do more dumps and everything like that, the system was down. So for us now, okay, this hotel probably is in the early stage. We don't research it anymore. So we came to a second system by the manufacturer we call M, like manufacturer. And that we found in a system in early 2019 in a quite upper class hotel I happened to, to live in. And the mobile key is used there basically everywhere instead of the normal key. You can use it like in the elevator, in your rooms, in the fitness center. So we got a mobile key and analyzed the TLS and BLE traffic as we have shown before in various cases. So here's a dump from the Mitten proxy tool, and you can see there's, there's something called a mobile key in the JSON data, and it starts with DT, and then there's some bytes. This is only the beginning, there's like 40 bytes of this following. And when we compared the key we received from the back end in this DT field with the key we saw on the air, we immediately noticed, oh, it's the same key. So would it be that simple that they just sent the key over the air so you could replay? So we looked at the full recording and realized, no, there's much more going on. So in the middle, there's actually the full key we got from the back end. So that, of course, was an indicator this will be fishy. There is something not so good. If the only secret the app has is going over the air, there must be a way to break it. But looking at the rest, we saw there's lots of data we don't understand. So we had to look into that further, and Michael will tell about you how we did that. Yeah, exactly. So um, there seemed to be some replay protection in the protocol as well. Um, as you can see uh, here, there is um, data we underlined. That seemed to be some kind of checksum. There was also the MAC address of the uh, lock uh, transmitted and uh, some values that changed all the time. Um, at that time, we assumed there will be a nonce and a CRC or some type of checksum um, or an HMAC maybe. But um, yeah, we tried CRCs. Um, if you want to do this, there are some tools available on the internet. Uh, for example, this uh, CRC reverse engineering <coughs> tool. Um, we just used a custom Python script. And then uh, we assumed that 16 bits may be the nonce and 16 bits uh, may be a CRC. 
uh, have a script um, that matches, that searches for a match in at least two of uh, the messages we got? Yes, and <laughs> basically it was exactly like this. Um, we found the polynom polynomial. Um, we also uh, saw that there is a seed value. Um, the seed value, that's the initial value when you calculate a CSE. Um, that was something that uh, was transmitted over the TLS session, and that's uh, uh, something that's constant within the hotel. It's called SC, I think it's something like system code. Um, for the next CSE, on the other hand, uh, they used the previous value as a seed. Um, so we were able to transmit um, the first packets, but then there's uh, the packet that contains the key, and that was a little bit more difficult. Um, uh, we, we did not initially find uh, the two bytes that, um, or the correct two values for these two bytes uh, to transmit this key correctly. Um, basically, we had uh, one block where the CSE was obviously not at the end, some constant bytes, uh, some, some zero bytes, and um, three previous CSE values. And yeah, that was a little bit of a puzzle, but <clears throat> basically it's not that difficult. Um, they used the previous values and uh, calculated again with the same algorithm as CSE and uh, overwrote this with zeros. So yeah, now we knew how to create this credential packet. We could verify that with a lot of traces we had uh, taken before. Um, again, we created a Python script to send this. Um, that would just take the device name. Uh, it would take these credential bytes that we could sniff out of the air uh, and then calculate the CSE. And uh, using GluePy, it would talk to the lock. Um, we tried this. Um, this um, shows how we actually um, got the key out of the air. Uh, it's our sniffing setup. Um, you see the three uh, sniffing boards. And uh, in this case, the simulated customer was on the inside of the door because uh, we thought it's a little bit sus suspicious if you set this up in uh, uh, the hotel floor <clears throat> and uh, outside in the hall. But uh, anyway, yeah, um, you can see we, we got the, the bytes. Um, our script would take these bytes and then we tried it in real life. Yes, yeah, so we had put the bytes, we sniffed on the air into our tool, and then we thought, okay, let's step out of the room, take our laptop, and try to run our script against the real thing. This is actually a real, our Python script running on the laptop on the actual hotel door, with the mates not getting too suspicious because we're in very quickly, as you can see. And it turned out, oh, we actually reached quite a nice, acceptable, 37th floor, $500 hotel suite with our CSC tool attack. So this system basically was pound by reversing CSCs. And this again is showing that security by obscurity is not the way to go for these kinds of things. So once we had this running, we thought, oh, let's analyze it a little more, go deeper into it. And we did again what we did earlier, write a Python script as a test target. So instead of having a script now to open the lock, we also built a script to emulate the lock. So with this script, we could play with the real app and our simulation now at home and analyze this further. So we wanted to know how big is this problem. So is this just this one hotel that we found or is it more? So with some digging around, we found there's a few more hotel change which were starting to deploy this product because we always have to see this is very new. We're very lucky that we got that this early because it wasn't deployed like in a thousand hotels so far. Sorry for that if you expected that, but it's a very emergent technology. One thing was very funny or interesting for us is that you could actually see it by the names of the locks. The locks announced a 60, uh, base 64 name that you could decode to binary and then found a certain pattern. So we could actually, from the outside, check if a hotel uses the vulnerable system or not. So imagine us going around with Bluetooth sniffers and checking hotels for, for the system. And we found actually a few, a few more rooms and then we booked one of the rooms in one of the hotels we identified as also vulnerable and found an even simpler variation of the protocol which did the first handshake and not this last CSC variation. So there's variations of that and at that time we also realized the manufacturer which actually is uh, the company Messerschmitt in Germany and they so there are no wrong uh, expectations there. They have like 2,000 hotels they supply locks to. 
but they're also going for quite upper class hotels, and those upper class hotels are not so much interested in Bluetooth locks. They want the customers to come to the desks. So it's in the lower level chains, or mid class chains, because they don't really provide lower level. So in those mid class chains, they're beginning to roll that out. So that's uh, not so many hotels currently, and luckily we informed them. But we thought about, okay, is this real, a real problem? Can you really do this in, in real life? So we tried about how would it uh, look in real life doing an exploitation. Of course, one thing you would have to do is to sniff the key. Using the BLE jack that worked quite fine in our in-room setup, the only thing you have to know in advance is the Bluetooth address of the lock you want to sniff. So you have to go to the lock before, identify this lock I'm going to sniff, so probably if you follow someone to his room, that wouldn't be so good. You would have to know all the MAC addresses of all rooms. Mm -hmm. So we thought about other places where you could sniff, and we thought about the fitness center. Many people go to the gym, and there we thought, oh, there might be options to hide a, hide a sniffing device somewhere. You see a lot of options there. We went for something quite near to the door. There's a plastic trash can lying there, and you can put a sniffer set up right to the bottom of it. So we thought, okay, let's put it there go to the otherwise other side of this door and try this out, and we figured the fitness center does not support BLE. <laughs> we later found out in communication with the hotel, which was very good, by the way, thank you for the general manager, who we've applied good to our research. Uh, it was vandalized for some reason, it was out of service right when we wanted to try it, oh my god. So we were, at, where else could we do it? Oh, there's the elevator. Everybody who lives in a hotel like you all currently do knows, if you go to an elevator, you have to activate the elevator. So people will do this with their app, of course. And unlike in a room or a fitness center, if there's someone standing next to you in the elevator having a backpack, you wouldn't think he's currently stealing your key. So that's very likely a possible attack. And one thing we even find out, is, or we realized, is if we use our simulator, which imposes as a lock in the elevator, and just by heavily Bluetooth advertising, the app of a user would probably connect to our app uh, Python script instead of the real lock. So this attack actually could be carried out without any special hardware at all. You just need a standard Linux laptop or other laptop with Bluetooth capabilities, run the Python script on it. So here we run our Python simulator script, tell him impose this lock, and it will happily record, as you see in the bottom, the key for us. So this key again then can be used to break into the room. So that was the point where we said, okay, this is a real thing we have to do a responsible disclosure process because it could actually harm people if it's getting in a wider use. So like in early April or mid of April, we contacted the vendor and we have to say very luckily, he directly responded. We know people who had other communication with, with disclosure, he had really immediate response. I mean, we put some research into finding the right person who to contact, but he said, hey, yeah, I'm the right person, please tell me more. We sent technical details to them, they thought about it, said, our technician says it can't really work that way, but we somehow understand what we're doing. So we said, okay, believe me, we did this in the real hotel. It's not theoretical, and we sent our proof of concept code. So then he saw, okay, obviously it's a real thing, and started very well with us beginning to discuss how do we work on that, and we're really thankful he never tried to prevent disclosure, and even so, this vulnerability currently is unfixed, so this is a real O-Day here, we think it's not that dangerous because the real user base, as you have shown in a show of hands, is not so big. So the real danger is not here yet because we got it very early, so we can still disclose this here. And the fixing is on the way, I think, in the running of this month, probably the hotels we have been in will be fixed because the vendor very well reacting to our disclosure. But it's not that easy. The locks in the first hotel we have been in there can be updated online because it's a very modern, uh, high-rise hotels where I think thousand rooms or something. So they are online and can be updated remotely. In the smaller hotels, it's like here the hotel locks are individually in the door. They are not connected. So someone has to go from door to door to door to upgrade them. And that only can start after the fix is developed. So this will take a little bit more time. And of course, as we said earlier, there's multiple app vendors who have to integrate this SDK. It's not that the vendor who's building the app, there's multiple parties involved. So one lesson we learned from the responsible disclosure, and that is really important, is that you have not to only identify the vendor, but only see who is else involved in this thing. We found out there's, there's multiple parties building the apps. 
there is multiple hotel chains. Those hotel chains are run by hotel groups. And our responsible disclosure to the vendor didn't immediately react in all of them uh, identifying uh, those, those other parties. Actually, the, we found out just last week that there's another vendor who built basically on the original design of the thing another lock. So they got a quite short notice now, but as we said, it's an early, early stage of development. So that's really the lesson learned. Do this communication, do the research. And so our, our takeaways for this um, event here is you should really know the BLE link layer can be sniffed reliable with cheap tools. So I'm not sure if the people who designed this protocol knew, but many probably did not really consider this. This is really a thing to consider. It can be sniffed. Don't rely on the link layer. Do application crypto. The other thing is don't hide any secrets in your app. Neither the algorithm nor keys or anything like that. If it's in the app, people can get it out there. You've earlier seen our reverse engineering possibilities. So whatever secret, try to build it in a way you could publish everything, just the secrets key, which are only known to the user, should secure it. And the thing for the research community or whatever or also uh, other uh, security enthusiasts here, BLE is not just padlocks or Chinese toys. It's more and more used in real-world applications. And all of you, and hopefully you now can, with following our presentation, should audit these things and look into this more. And I can just say it again, the slides will be online. There's lots of links in it. So if you couldn't follow everything now in this very short run through lots of various concepts, look up the slides, look up the methods. It's really not so hard to get into. We have multiple ways to attack this, multiple layers you can go there. So it's really worth doing it, and we hope you enjoyed it and are going to have fun with blue BLE elements. And that's our presentation. <laughs> so we actually have like three minutes for questions. So please, the people leaving now, be quiet so people wanting to, to ask questions can go to the mics. We have three minutes. For questions, please feel free to come. So, or contact us. Yeah, we have an email, email address here. So, if you're involved with any vendor or anything, if you are worried, so just email to us this address. Probably the next days we're at DEF CON, so don't expect an immediate answer. But first, the direct option would be to go to the mics and ask some questions. It's hard to see, <laughs> but there's open slots, so. I think we overloaded you all at end of black at here, but it's the last slot, so probably that's acceptable. Or you can also just, if we close this here, come to the stage and we'll walk over to the, the wrap up room where we can do some private conversations. Okay, thank you everyone. But so, no questions, okay. thanks again. Okay.